The prodigal God, today's lesson is called Give Me My Share. Give Me My Share. The, uh, uh, tonight, I want to, to simply tell you a story and talk about it. It's an old story from another time and another place, and it has a very profound meaning for every one of us. Uh, it's nothing new. Uh, we've all heard it before. If you've been in church for a while, you've heard sermon after sermon after sermon on the prodigal son. And uh, um, some days I wonder how could I even dare to put a new twist on it when uh, sometimes the best thing you could ever hear is its original meaning and what it holds for us. And what I hope tonight and through this lesson to help uh, each one of us with is to see it like maybe we've never seen it before, that it can help us uh, uh, by seeing it maybe the way Jesus was talking because there, there's some things, how you know just because Jesus said doesn't mean we all always get it. Some, there are some things Jesus teaches that's too hard to comprehend. It goes right over my head. And if I got a degree in the Bible, man, I, I imagine every one of us, there's just stuff that makes us swim. There may be stuff you understand, I don't. And so I need you to come walk your pastor through it. There's plenty that's in the Word of God that mystifies me. But I need you to understand, God does not long to be a mystery. God wants to be understood. God wants us to know who He is and what His Word says about Him. So look with me at Luke chapter 15. This is I'm reading out of the NIV, starting with verse 11. This is the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the, son, the younger son got together with all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. If there's a pig farmer, how do you understand it's probably not in Israel? It's probably somewhere else. So he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but he is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. Verse 26, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has come back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father saying, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. But yet you have never given me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your, your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The third of Jesus' parables is the longest and probably the most famous. Last week we talked about the lost uh, sheep and then we talked about the lost coin and now we talk about the lost son. The other two get a little bit of mention, but this one gets a whole lot more uh, because it's a, it's, a lot, uh, uh, it's a lot cooler story. Uh, it's a story about a family. There's a father, an older brother, and, a, and a, uh, an older son and a younger son. And the story begins when the younger son comes to the father and he says, give me my share of the estate. Now, in ancient times when the father died, 
the property be, would be divided up and the oldest son would get what was considered a double portion of any other child. Uh, if there was more children, it got thinned out a little bit. There's only two sons here. And so the older would get two thirds of the estate while the younger would get one third. So the story opens with his younger son asking for one third of all that the father owns. What would be all of this is the inheritance. And again, you got to remember, it's not just uh, uh, liquid cash. We're talking goats and sheep. We're talking land uh, and, and everything else that goes with it. And so all of this property, as well as what monies they may have had, uh, one third of it belonged to the son. Now, uh, tonight, what we're going to sit around is the significance of the youngest son's request. I want us to look at exactly what was the youngest son saying when he said, give me my share of the inheritance. We're going to look at the meaning of the request. We're going to look at the response to that request. And then we're going to focus on what difference that makes for us. Now, in the meaning of this request that takes place, keep your Bibles open. Look with me at verses 11 and 12. It says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, the younger son's request was stunning because of the, uh, the inheritance, of course, had to be divided up, and it wasn't but it was going to have to be divided up and distributed. And, and, and this wouldn't normally take place until the father had died. Now, Kenneth Bailey, uh, uh, an author, says uh, in one of his books, he quotes this. He said, in Middle Eastern culture, to ask for the inheritance while the father is alive is to wish him to be dead. To ask the father for your inheritance now is to tell him, I wish you would hurry up and die Give me what I want. The request was therefore, uh, would have been a disgrace to the family's name because word would have got out that he was, uh, uh, he was wanting the father to be dead. This would have been a disgraceful action on behalf of the child. And how do you know when we have children, our children are going to be children. And uh, uh, my, there are days I look at my youngest son and think we must not love him very much. Look at how he left this house dressed. Of course, then I realized we didn't see him. <laughs> he left well before we could see him. I, I saw him the other day, and my, my word, he had three different colors, Brother Ed, and none of them went together. And, uh, uh, of course, my wife begins to say he gets that from your side of the family. <laughs> it always, if it's negative, it's always my side of the family. Um, and so it, what he had done would have been a disgraceful thing to the family's name. You, growing up, where you did, I'm sure there were people uh, in your community that people would, if there was a, a thing of shame or disgrace, there was a certain family's name would come up that uh, you're a disgrace just like them or they are a disgraceful people. You don't want nothing to, to do with that family. Well, that's what this family was going to wind up becoming because of how the younger son acted. And because of the, his, his disrespect for his father, it would have also been a, a, an economic blow to the family's stability uh, since the father would have to sell part of the estate in order to give him his share. It, it's, uh, it's not like I got the money just sitting around, son. I'm going to have to sell off uh, um, you know, a good portion of what we own, of the land uh, and, and everything else. And uh, in short, this request was going to rip the family apart. This one child's action is going to devastate not only the family, it's going to devastate the servants that are a part of the family. It's going to devastate extended family. It's even going to put a black eye in the community. Isn't it amazing how one person's decision can affect a whole lot of people? We have got to be careful how we act because when we throw a rock, you know, proverbially speaking, you throw a rock in the water, you get ripples that can go for a long ways. So we have to be careful. This is a good example of it. It was a relational and economic act of violence against the family's integrity. This was something that was just going to totally just devastate them. Why on earth would the youngest son make such a request? Why would he say, I wish you were dead so I could have my part of the loot? Why would he be like that? 
If you've been around church a long time, if you've studied church history, there's a guy from way, way, way back called Augustine. Augustine wrote a treatise called Confessions. And in his work called Confessions, he gives us a theory of why we do what we do, especially why we sin. Let me read you just a, a, a quote from uh, uh, what I would consider a startling observation from Augustine's Confessions. He said this, A man has murdered another man. What was his motive? Either he desired his wife or his property or else he would have to steal to support himself, or else he was afraid of losing something to that man, or else, having been injured, he was burning to be revenged upon that person. Augustine goes on to say that even a murderer murders because he loves something. He will commit murder because there is a, an issue of love right there. You can say, well, what kind of love would that be? It would be something like this. He loves romance or he loves wealth, or he loves his reputation, or he loves something else too much, inordinately, more than God. He loves something more than God, so he's willing to kill in order to have that thing, and that's why he murders. Our hearts are distorted by a term that Augustine uses called disordered loves. Disordered loves, meaning I have a good thing, but I don't love it in its right order. Because I love it out of order, that right thing now becomes a wrong thing between me and God. We love, we rest our hearts in, and we look to things to give us joy and meaning that only God can give. That ought to strike home. That ought to make sense to us because we've either seen it in other people's lives or we've seen it in ourselves. You've heard the, the saying where inside of us is a God-shaped hole and we try to, to fill that God-shaped hole with all kinds of things. We'll try to put a car. We'll try to put uh, a spouse. We'll try to put children. We'll try to put ambitions. We'll try to put money in that hole, but it doesn't fit because nothing fits that hole inside of us like God. Because it was made exclusively for God. And no matter what you throw into that hole, not only will it not fit, it will never satisfy until God comes into that place. How many know what I'm talking about? So this is what he's dealing with by having a disordered love means I'm trying to put a good thing into a place it was never meant to be. Now, it's... Kind of shift gears here a second. We have a hard time understanding why God would ask Abraham. Here's a good example. Why would God ask Abraham to take Isaac up to the mountain and sacrifice him? Why on earth would that happen? Isaac was Abraham's long-awaited answer to prayer, and now God wants him back. Uh, God has said not to commit uh, human sacrifice, and now God wants a human sacrifice. Uh, I've heard people, people have told me that's why they don't believe in God is because God contradicts his own law by asking for human sacrifice. Was a human sacrifice ever made? No. God wasn't interested in human sacrifice. God was interested in Abraham's heart. Abraham had removed God from the throne of his heart and had placed Isaac there. Isaac was now more important to him than God. God wanted to make sure that God was on the throne of Abraham's heart. And there's nothing like a little bit of a test. God would never test me. Sure he does. Sure he does. God was trying to see, will you love me more? Because of a disordered love. Can we take a God-given thing and turn it into a bad thing? Can you take a holy thing and turn it into an unholy thing? Absolutely, absolutely. Because we try to use that thing in our flesh, we try to put that thing where God needs to be. And, and pretty soon it turns out to be something horrible. Abraham was more in love with God's creation than God. When God asked for Isaac, he didn't want Isaac, he wanted to make sure he had Abraham's heart. And if Abraham's heart was not right, then he wanted Abraham's heart back. He wanted it in right alignment. We have sung a song, and our worship team has done. Uh, uh, David Crowder does a song um, uh, where it, it says something like this. He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. 
I am a tree bending beneath the wind and the weight of his mercy. I remember that song. He is a jealous God. He's a jealous God who overwhelms us, not with his anger, not with his rage, not with his fits of jealousy. He overwhelms us with his love. He's so jealous for us and for our attention, he bathes us in love. He overwhelms us with loving kindness that we do not deserve. Why? Because he doesn't want to compete for our heart. And yet what does God have to do every day with each one of us? He has to compete for our heart, for things that do not satisfy and don't matter. And what has taken place... Uh, uh, Ask yourself, is there anything in my life that may have taken God's place on the throne of my heart? Is there something that God has to compete with in me? What disordered loves are in my life? Now, the younger son, the younger son uh, may have lived with his father and may have even obeyed his father, yet this son did not love his father. Listen to me. The youngest son did not love his father because if he loved his father, he wouldn't be asking for the father to die so he could go ahead and have his stuff. The thing that the son loved ultimately was his father's things, not his father. His heart was set on the wealth and on the comfort and on the freedom and on the status that the wealth would bring. And his father was simply a means to an end. I'm only with you, Dad, because I want what the will says is coming to me. I don't really love you. I just want what I can get out of this. I even know that's a terrible way to have a family. Terrible thing to, to, to have to live with. And now, however, his patience was done with. He's not patient anymore. He knew the request would be a knife in his father's heart, but obviously he didn't care what the father thought. Instead, he just wanted the father to know he wanted stuff. Let me ask you this. What's your motivation for serving God? What is our motivation for serving God? So I can get stuff from God? So I can, uh, uh, you know, have I fallen in love with God? Or am I trying to uh, escape hell? Is God fire insurance to me or is he more than that there was a time when all I thought of God for was I, I, I say I love God but really what I was was I was afraid of hell I hung on to the feet of Jesus so tight because I didn't want to go to hell eventually there came a place where I realized okay I'm safe apparently I'm not going to hell let me find out whose feet I'm holding on to and once I looked up from his feet to his face then I fell in love with God I'm not going to fall in love with God when I'm just holding on to his feet because there's no relationship there. It's desperation. But when I quit looking at his feet and start looking at his face, then I don't have to worry about it because I'm so in love with God, I want to be with him. If I'm, if I'm just desperate for missing hell, that tells me my heart is not in true alignment with the Father. Somebody hearing me on that. We're loving God for what we can get out of him. Do I have a relationship with Jesus or is he basically a genie on a bottle that every time I, I, every time I get in trouble, I just rub that lamp and out pops Jesus to save the day? I can't tell you how many times, and we're all guilty of it. When we're going through good times, what is our prayer life like? <laughs> God loves you so much, he's going to send some trouble your way. Oh, that's not a loving God. Sure it is. Because that loving God knows if I stir you up a little bit with a little bit of problem, you're going to come running to me. Can I tell you the times when I've been closest to God and God has been so powerful in my life was when I was going through a problem. I can look back in my life and say, man, I was blazing hot for God at this time in my life. What I need to do is look about 30 days prior to that. And I would see where I was going down for the third time saying, Jesus, save me or I'm a, I'm a goner. And God comes in, saves the day, and what does that sweet renewing of the relationship do? When I'm down at the altar and down at the altar and I'm praying and I'm desperate and things are happening, what happens? Woo, God's, God's real in my life and things are happening. Well, of course it is. But then just as you're never going to stay in a valley all the time, how do you know you can't stand on the mountain all the time either? Mountaintops are for shouting. Valleys are for growing. I've got to get back in that valley because I've got to get down there and grow some and so I can get back up on the other side and, and get some healing. 
Here's a, here's a great a, an irony of the story that we're going to look at later. The two sons look very different on the surface. One runs off and lives a horrible life. One stays home and obeys and serves his father. Yet at the end, the older son is furious with the, father, with the father and he actually humiliates the father by refusing to go into the feast. When the father commands a feast, he said, kill the fatted calf and bring everybody in. This was not a suggestion. This was a command. Everybody that's under his authority, his influence is going to be there. And then he invites who? The surrounding people to come and celebrate with them. Well, those that come and celebrate with him from outside the family begin to take notice that the son is refusing to come inside. That is blatant disregard. That is blatant rebellion on the son's part. And so here... The, uh, the son says, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going inside. This is the older son's way of saying he will not live in the same family as the younger son. Remember the, the white table and the black table we had last week? You have one side that says, I don't want to be with the other side. This side says, I don't deserve to be with the other side. Hmm, how do we get the two of them together? So again, the family's integrity and the father's heart are under assault but by the older son now. Whereas the, the younger son ripped the father's heart out by saying, I wish you'd die so I can have some stuff. And then, and then he has to sell stuff and, and hurt his own reputation by doing it. But now he's got the older son who's been there all along, yet he's just as damaging, not only to the father's heart, but to the father's reputation as well because he will not participate. It's interesting Verse 30 says the, uh, the, 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 the brother, the older son, in verse 30 says, this son of yours, a lover of prostitutes, this son of yours. And then it's interesting, the father applies in verse 32 and says, this brother of yours who was gone has now come home. What did the father do? He put it right back in his son's court. He said, oh, no, no. I'm not going to let you off with this. He is your brother, and you will accept him. Puts it right back on him. Why? The older brother objects to the expense of what the father is doing. We're going to look at, probably next week, we're going to look at the older brother uh, a little more in detail. But he, and, and you'll find out, the older brother has a legitimate right to be angry. He has a legitimate right to be angry. The older brother objects to the expense of what the father is doing and uh, he shows that he has been obeying the father to get his things. I've been obedient to you, uh, yet you haven't given me anything. He's being obe obedient to the father because he wants the father's things, not because he loves the father. So here we are. The younger one didn't love the father. He just wanted him to die so he can get his stuff. What is the, other, other, the uh, older son doing? He's waiting for the father to die too. They're both waiting on dad to die so they can have daddy's stuff. My parents are big fans of a bumper sticker on the back of their car and their RV that says we're spending our kids' inheritance. <laughs> They're going to make sure we're not going to have anything to fight over. <laughs> you get what you get. So both of them are willing to put the father to shame because they love the father's things. They don't love the father. Mm. Now, let's look at the response to this request. Uh, verse 12, the, the last part of verse 12 says this. So the father divided his property between them. Skip down to verse 20. It says, so he got up and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. Now, the younger son's request to the father would have shocked Jesus' listeners in that day, uh, but 
as much as it would have shocked them, the father's response was even more remarkable. I mean, mind-blowing. Who on earth would have thought a father, a Middle Eastern father, would even act like this? This was what was known as a patriarchal society, meaning it was father-ruled. It was elder man-ruled. That uh, uh, in this kind of society, you are required to show deference and reverence to those that are either older than you or above you. Uh, women, and the same thing did apply to, to older women, but men and women both combined submitted to the, well, I guess you'd call them the alpha male, the, the father, the grandfather. That was the one whom all of it rotated around. And so this, this father... Um, had a certain level of distinguishment he had to carry himself at because everybody else was looking to him. They all followed his lead. And this kind of contempt and insolence uh, towards the father would have been met with outrage. Uh, the listeners to this story, and we have to remind ourselves, this is a story. We don't know that this thing actually happened. Sometimes I wonder, where on earth did Jesus get his material from? Uh, this could have been something he saw being lived out and he used it as an illustration and kind of built on it. I don't know, but it's fascinating. But the listeners of that day would have listened to this story and would have been enraged and they would expect the father to explode in wrath and drive the son out with, with blows about the head and neck, you know, just angry at him or even kill him. You have to remember that the Old Testament said that if there is a rebellious child in your house, you take them outside the city gates with witnesses and you put that child to death. You kill them. You stone them because God will not tolerate rebellion within the camp, within the people. That was Mosaic law. And so here, not only could have he been disowned, not only could he have been beaten, but he could have been put to death. That could have happened. Now, instead, we read the simple words that he said in verse 12. So he divided his property between them. Now, again, Keep this in historical context. What, what was the day like? In those days, most of the family's wealth was their land and property. Uh, uh, and the family land was part of their identity. It was likely that the father had to sell some of his land in order to, to become liquid and give the younger son his share. Now remember, this is property that is passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. What would happen if I've got property to sell, but none of my family can buy it from me? Then what happens? Now I've sold land outside of our family to somebody else, and that really is going to make me a goat with the rest of my family because now it's fallen outside of our control, something that was part of our inheritance. Now, this, uh, this is reflected, this selling of the property right here, uh, it's, it, there's an unusual word in the Greek where it says, uh, look there in verse 12, it says, so he divided his property. That word property in the Greek is an unusual word because it's, the word is bios. And the word bios literally translates to life. And so it has a, a literal meaning here. It says he divided his life between his two sons. Why would you use that word? Probably Jesus used that word to convey what it felt like for the father to lose his land, to lose the love of his sons, to lose his good name and status right there in front of everybody. Literally, the father is being asked to tear his very life apart. And he does. He does. Look with me at uh, page 22 if you have your books. Look with me at page 22. <clears throat> About halfway down <clears throat> page 22, it says this. The wealth of this father would have primarily been in real estate. To get one-third of his net worth, he would have to sell a great deal of his land holdings. In our mobile urbanized culture, we don't understand the relationship of the people in former generations to their land. Consider the line in Rodgers and Hammerstein's musical, Oklahoma, where they said, Oh, we know that we belong to the land, and the land we belong to is grand. 
Notice that it doesn't say the land belongs to them, but rather they belong to it. This neatly sums up how in the people's, uh, the past people's very identities, they were tied into their places or their land. To lose part of your land was to lose part of yourself and a major share of your standing in the community. We have all heard stories of powerful and successful CEOs, both men and women, chucking their whole careers in order to care for a hurting and needy child. While not exactly an exact parallel, this is what the father does. Versus giving up the role of president of IBM or Microsoft in order to stay home and take care of a child or an invalid wife or something like this, here's a man who is willing to give up everything in order to please his son. That would sound wasteful. That sounds like a parent who should have beat their child more often, doesn't it? It sounds like a parent that, that, that spoils their child to the point that the child is disrespectful and hateful towards the parent. How you'd agree with me on that? Come on. That's what it sounds like. My kids told me, Dad, I wish you'd die. Sell what you got so I can have my share of it right now. You're only 44. I wish you're 84 and you'd be dead. I would kick my kid in Jesus' name. If you add Jesus' name to it, you can do whatever you want because it's in, it's in Jesus' name. My, my younger son, I have, a, I have a sword in my office, and, uh, uh, and he's fascinated with my sword. And, uh, uh, and then he'd look in our gun case, and he'd see our guns, and he'd say, uh, uh, Daddy, when you die, can I have your sword? Do you know what my son was asking? It wasn't when you die, can I have your sword? It's how soon will you die so I can have your sword? Now, he's only eight years old. Does he really want his dad to die? He'd find out real fast that that sword's not going to love him like, like his daddy would. But it's the same picture. It's the same picture. And here, this son is wanting his father to lose everything so he can have what a spoiled brat would want. Now, the older son and anyone else in the community of that fact, because, again, they're not living their life in a, in a vacuum. Uh, they're living life in front of everybody. It's kind of like they live in Poen. It's so small, everybody knows your business. You can't sneeze on this side of town without Dana Till on the other side of town saying, Bless you, Brother Mike. I heard you all the way over here. You know, we live in a small community. They probably in that time lived in a very small rural community. Everybody's business was everybody's business. And everybody would have thought that the father was being foolish to give in to the younger son's request. But looking back, we know better. If the father had become embittered and perhaps beat the young man like the young man deserved or done something more severe to him, no restoration would have ever happened. Think about that. If he had have acted the way that we think he ought to have acted, the father's heart would have been too hardened to ever receive the son back or the son may never have expected to be brought back, much less even wanted to. Why, that old man beat me within an inch of my life? There's no way I'll go back home. Think about how the reaction would have set the stage for what a future consequence would have been. How many times do we burn a bridge? Think about this. How many times would we react and burn a bridge that didn't need to be burned? And so by bearing the agony and the pain of the son's sins upon himself, instead of taking revenge, instead of paying the son back by inflicting pain on him, think about this. The father kept the door open in the relationship. The father was willing to suffer for the sin of the child so that someday reconciliation could be possible. I hope you're understanding the depths of the love of God that God has for you. I mean, you see this in the story that the father to the son is God to you. That's the kind of love. That's the prodigal love. That prodigal that means wasteful, excessively given and spent. That prodigal love that God lavished on you. Paul says the, the, the love the Father has lavished on us. That word lavish could probably be in the same connotation as the word prodigal. God lavishes love on us that we do not 
deserve. Turn with me if you got your books. Look at page 25. Page number 25, uh, about halfway down. It says, we come to the dramatic third and final scene of Act 1. The younger son comes within sight of the house. He sees, the father sees him and he runs. He runs to him. Now listen to this. As a general rule, distinguished Middle Eastern patriarchs did not run. Children might run, women might run, young men might run, but the pater familias, the dignified pillar of the community, the owner of the great estate, did not. He would not pick up his robes and bare his legs like some boy, but this father does. He runs to his son, showing his emotions openly, falling upon him and kissing him. This almost surely would have taken the younger son by surprise. Flummoxed, he tries to roll out his business plan for restoration. And the father interrupts him, not only ignoring his rehearsed speech, but directly contradicting it. Quick, he says to his servants, bring me the best robe and put it on him. What was he saying? The best robe in the house would have been the father's own robe. The unmistakable sign of restored standing in the family. The father is saying, I'm not going to wait until you've paid off your debt. I'm not going to wait until you have duly groveled. I am simply going to take you back. I will cover your nakedness, poverty, and rags with the robes of my office and honor. He's taking him back in. What happens when you take the son back in? The name goes back on the will. Somebody needs to consider that. We'll cover that on a later date. So here, he commands that the servants prepare a feast of celebration with the fattened calf as the main course. In that society, most meals did not include meat, which was an expensive delicacy. Meat was often reserved for special occasions and parties, but no meat was more expensive than the fattened calf. To throw such a feast would have been something that happened only on the rarest occasions, and likely the entire village would have been invited. Word spread quickly and soon that there was a full-fledged feast going on with music and dancing all to celebrate the restoration restoration of the younger son to life, family, and community. Now skip with me over to page 31. And look at the very bottom of page 31. You'll have to read the previous parts later to get a good flavor of this, but I want you to see this. Finally, we come to the denouncement. How will the father respond to the older son's open rebellion? Because, and he spells it out in the book as to why you really see this as the older son is rebelling against the father by not coming in, by staying outside. What will he do? A man of his time and place might have disowned his son on the spot. Instead, he responds again with amazing tenderness. My son, he begins, despite how you have insulted me publicly, I still want you in the feast. I'm not going to disown your brother, but I don't want to disown you either. I challenge you to swallow your pride and come into the feast. The choice is yours. Will you or will you not? It is an unexpectedly gracious, dramatic appeal. The father not only shows grace to the young son, the father goes out of his way to show grace to the older son. The question is, does the older son see it? Does he get it? So here's where the difference is made for us, the third part. First of all, it means that whether we are that kind of like that irreligious, freewheeling, younger brother type, or we're the moral religious elder brother type. We have a problem, what Augustine calls disordered love or idols in the heart. We all face this. Every single one of us face this. We, it may be something as, as, as precious as our children or our grandkids. It could be our job. It could be anything. As a pastor, it could be putting my church before God that I'm more concerned about my church than I am the Lord because the Lord could tell a pastor, all right, you need to do this thing. Well, God, I'm not gonna do that. Well, I may hurt somebody's feelings or, or, or this may drive a wedge with me and my people or this could cost me my job. 
I have to realize as a pastor, this is not my church. This is God's church. And if I'm going to pastor this church right, I've got to do it God's way. And so I have to take self out of the way. This cannot become a God to me that I'm worried about what could take place. Lord, it's yours. We can, we can put the craziest things in that seat of the throne of our heart. This, let's, let's put disordered love in a more modern sense. And I want you to catch this. I want you to see this. Suppose there's a wife who has a husband and the husband spends hours with another woman talking uh, about all of his and her problems. He goes traveling with this other woman and he talks and thinks about her incessantly. Now, the wife confronts her husband and says, what's the problem? He responds. When, when she confronts him and says, I don't like this. This is not a good arrangement here. I don't like how this looks and everything. I don't like how it makes me feel. And the husband responds and says, what's the problem? I married you, didn't I? I pay the mortgage, don't I? I do all my duties, don't I? And if somebody asks, I tell them that you're my wife, not her. So what's the problem? Why are you so upset? Leave me alone. And the woman would say, and I would add rightly, that someone else has captured his heart and his imagination. Now, suppose there's a Christian who says he serves God with all of his heart, but he or she devotes all of their time and energies to other things. I love God with all my heart, and yet we're busy chasing this and doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that. That person's relationship with God is more of a drudgery and an obligation than it is a passion. Suppose the Holy Spirit comes to that man or woman and confronts them of their apathy. And you and I would reply and we'd say, what's the problem? I've prayed the sinner's prayer, didn't I? I attend church, don't I? I give in the offering sometimes, don't I? I'm not perfect, but I'm better than a lot of, lo than a lot of other people, aren't I? So I don't see what the problem is. Why don't you leave me alone? That's exactly what we do. It's exactly what we do. Every one of us. Because we're guilty of chasing other things more passionately than the things of God. This, in essence, is the struggle of mankind pursuing God. Is because other things catch our eye. Other things become more important. And we can, we can listen to the first story and say, well, that boy ought to know better. Somebody need to get hold of him. Somebody need to straighten him out on his wife's behalf. Shame on that man. But then when you put it on this other, oh, wait, 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 wait. I love God. <laughs> we're quick to defend ourselves. I'm not that bad. Can I tell you something? If we're going to be pleasing to the heart of the Father, we cannot lie. We have to say, I am a sinner a dirty, rotten sinner that is being saved by grace. If I was totally saved, I'd be in heaven by now. I am being saved. Why do you say being saved, Pastor Mike? Because I ain't perfect yet. I still make mistakes. And as long as I got that sin nature in me, there's still a thing that craves sin. That means there's a sinful part in me that still hungers for something other than God. Because if I truly loved God, all of my attention would be on him. How do you know this is what we battle? This is what we fight. This is what we face. This is what we need to encounter. We deal with this. Something else has captured our heart and our imagination. Just because I say I'm a Christian, just because I say I'm a Christ follower, I have to stop and ask, am I really doing it to the degree that God loves or to the degree that I think is okay and acceptable. How do you know the Bible says that there stand before God people who will say, but Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things in your name? And what will Jesus say? Depart from me. You did ministry, but you didn't own my heart. I never knew you. I never knew you. I'm telling you, friends, hell will be populated with church-going people. That's the scariest thing of all, is to know that I could come to church faithfully and still miss heaven. Because I got it here, but I never got it here. Mm. 
Many of us are like the elder brother. We obey the rules, but our real heart and passion is for something else. Our career, making money, our children, peer acceptance. If there's anything that has a controlling position in our heart, if there's anything more important to our happiness than God, then that thing has become a God to us. It is a disordered love. It's a good thing in a wrong place. God gives us good things, and we can take that good thing and we can put it in a wrong place. And now God has to get rid of that thing because we've turned that good thing and we've made it into a bad thing. We've turned that wonderful thing and turned it into a sin, a sin. We have to recognize these things for what they are. Do you see them in your own life? What difference does the Father's response to this request make for us? Secondly, it means that the Lord, by watching the Father's reaction, it means the Lord has done for us what the Father in the parable did for his Son. When God came into this world, we would have expected him to come in wrath. We would expect for him to come and drive us out with blows, but he didn't. He didn't come with the sword in his hand. He came with nails in his hands. He did not come to bring judgment. He came to bear judgment. That's the love he has for us. And Jesus went to the cross in weakness. And in there, voluntarily, his life was literally torn apart from him. All he had left, the only thing Jesus owned left was his garment. And it was, it was taken from him and lots cast for it. And it was given away to somebody else. But he did that so that we would repent. This, When Jesus told the story of the prodigal son, he's telling the story of his own life because literally just as the sons would say, I wish you'd die so we can get what we need, literally Jesus had to die so we would get what we'd need and that Jesus would wind up having to get rid of everything. Even his own garments were being taken from him and sold off. Jesus gave up everything for you and I. And not just for you and I. I want you to take a good look around these empty chairs. These empty chairs aren't here just so we can have something to do with the concert. These empty chairs are here so that the lost could find their way into this place and find Jesus Christ. Not become members of Poe and Assembly of God, but become members of God's own family. That's why we're here. They, this isn't just for us. It's for everybody that we can share this message with. In a spiritual sense, when we see the absolute beauty of what Jesus does for us, it should capture our heart. It should capture our heart and say, God, thank you for what you did for me. By leaving everything. The more we look at Jesus, the more we should love him above everything else. Jesus will capture your heart so that nothing matters more than he does. And when you see what he's done for you, it makes the worst times bearable and the best times not only livable, but leavable. I have got to be able to say, Lord, whatever you want of my life, it's yours. Whatever you desire of me, I'll do it, Lord God. If you want me to give something up, I give it up to you. If you want me to leave, I've got to be willing to leave from here and go to there. You and I have got to be able to live a life that's not only livable, but leavable that I could leave it behind for God's sake. That if God said, shake off your robe and come on. If God said, leave the plow behind. Let the dead bury their own dead, as Jesus told one person. Come and follow me. Let me ask you, friend, can you live your life in such a way that it gives glory to God and that you could leave everything at a moment's notice and follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Just as a missionary that stood up here the other night and he said, I had to give up my career. I had to give up what was comfortable. I had to give up family so that we could move from Salem, Arkansas over to some place in the middle of China. Let me ask you, church, are you as an individual willing, if God said, I want you to go there, I want you to do this, I want you to change your occupation, I want you to change your life, would you be willing to say yes this is the hardest part because we come to God saying, Lord, I want what you got for me. But then God has to be able to say, fine, then I need you to do this for me with what I've given you. Because when God gives us something, it's to live this life for his glory, not for our own satisfactions. And that's the hardest part. 
is I get a raise and I think I deserve that raise. I think I'm going to spend myself to where I'm living paycheck to paycheck just because I'm entitled to this and I got another raise. So I'm going to, it's a shame that, that my, as my, my increase of, of living, uh, uh, my income goes up, so does my debt. My debt doesn't stay or go down. Instead, my debt follows with me. Why do I wind up doing? I'm eating my seed corn that God has given me because God may say, I'm not giving you this raise just so you can spend yourself into oblivion. I'm giving you a raise because I need you to be able to give this money to a missionary. I need you to give it to the church. I need you to give this money to ministry. I need you to use it. I'm giving it to you because I need you to give it back to me. And what do we do? Hey, I deserve this. I think I'll go get something. And then God is stuck. God is stuck. How many times would God ask of us of something of our life and we say, but God, but God, I can't. Give your car away, huh? but God. Give your house away, but God. Do this, go there, but God. We'll talk ourselves out of what God wants to do. What have we done? We have talked ourselves into rebellion. We have talked ourselves into a place just like the older son when the father says, come in and celebrate, come in and be a part of, and we stand outside and say, no, I won't. I won't. Suddenly, we're as bad as what we think the younger sons are. The younger sons that live in their drug addiction, they live in their pornography, they live in their in their uh, uh, their gambling, they live in their promiscuous lifestyle, they live in their homosexual lifestyle, they live in everything that we could think of as sin. Why that's just filthy, rotten sin over here. I'm not like one of them. Then God says, "Fine, then come over here and do this for me." No. Suddenly, I'm no better to the Father than they are, and yet. They're acting out of their natural self. They don't know any better. They may never have heard the name of Jesus Christ or they don't know that there's a way to live. They don't know that there's a God to serve. They don't know there's a better way. So they're trapped by their sin nature of not knowing. I instead doom myself because of what I do know, but I live in a rebellion. All right, everybody breathe. Pastor Mike, you're nailing me to the cross. No, I'm not unless you feel yourself there then. Yeah, you should be, Phyllis. I mean, uh, this is stuff that ought to hit home with every one of us because the fact is, if we're not careful, one side's no better than the other. Both are lost. Both are despising the Father. Both are being disobedient. If anything, they're being normal. We are not. We are not. I want to ask you, church, do we have idols in the heart? Do we have things in wrong balance? Do we have a disordered love, good things that we make bad, blessings that we turn into our curses? John Newton, we'll end with this. John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace. Everybody loves that song. John Newton wrote another hymn, uh, a, a less popular hymn, one that probably none of us have ever heard of. But there's a line in this hymn that goes like this. Our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, since we have seen his beauty, are joined to part no more. It is our highest pleasure, no less than duty's call, to love him beyond measure and to serve him with our all. The amazing thing is that with my wife, I can do a few things and I make her happy. With my kids, I can do a few things and I make them happy. But with God, God's not interested in a few things in my life. God is actually very demanding. God doesn't want a part of you and I. He wants all of you and I. He will not be second. He will not be third. He will not be 14th. He will be number one in our life. And if he's not, what are we going to hear when we stand before the throne? Depart from me. 
worker of iniquity. Iniquity, but God, I've been doing ministry all this time. I've been living for you. Our iniquity wasn't so much in what we did to other people. Our iniquity was what we did to him. Our disobedience and our rebellion. Let me tell you something, church. If we're going to be guilty of anything, we need to be guilty of being faithful. How do you want to be blessed? How do you want blessings in your life? You want to live in God's blessing spectrum where wherever you go, you are blessed beyond measure. D.L. Moody once said, I was so blessed after I got saved. Said, said, when I got saved, he was a shoe salesman. His Sunday school teacher came by his shoe store, led him to Christ. And it says that the next day, he said, the birds sounded sweeter. The sky looked bluer. Said, it, it was like for the next few days, God was pouring out so much grace and mercy and love and blessing on me, I actually had to ask him to stay his hand. Can you imagine that? To be so blessed that you got to say, okay, God, stop. I'm drowning in blessing. I'd kind of like to be there. I don't know about you. If we want to live a blessed life, we have got to live faithfully and obediently to the Father. Blessing will always follow faithfulness and obedience. And that's who we need to be. Somebody got a comment or a question in regard to this right here. I hope I'm not boring you to death with this, but I'm telling you, there's something for us to learn. And I'm telling you, it cuts deep. It cuts deep. Because when Jesus told the story, he wasn't necessarily talking to the younger brothers. He was talking to us. He was talking to us. Father, thank you for this night. And Lord Jesus, I pray right now that you would search our hearts, Lord God. Search our hearts and see if there be any wicked thing inside of us. Search our hearts, Lord Jesus, and see if we might have an idol in our heart. And Father, I would pray that there would be nothing, absolutely nothing, that separates us from you. I don't want anything that keeps us, Lord, from the table. Every one of us can find our place with you. Every one of us can find our place in your mercy. Father, I pray that you would help us to find that place. Search us, Lord God. That, Father, I believe I'm talking to church people here. But, Lord, I'm convicted by what I've studied. I'm convicted by what I've heard. I'm convicted by the very words that I've spoken. Because, Lord God, I want you to be the Lord of all my life. If it was a matter of making a decision and saying, this is what I'm going to do and I'm just going to make my life belong to God, then I'll never succeed. But when I give you my life and say, Lord, come in and change me, I give you permission to come in and take out the things that don't need to be there and put in the things that do need to be there. If I give you permission, and that sounds like a scary prayer, but if I give you permission to do it, you will. And then I will be fit for heaven because now it's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Father, I pray right now, live through us, work through us, change our hearts, change our ambitions, change our wants, change our desires. Help us, Lord God, to hunger for you, to want you, to need you. That, Father, we don't just love you for what we get. We don't just say, Lord, give me my share. But instead, we realize everything you have belongs to us. The question is, is does everything of me belong to you? Lord, I love you. Speak to our hearts. Challenge us. And Father, make us more the people of God and the church of God that you desire. And Father, we just love you. Watch over us. Give us a great rest of this week. Put people in our path that we can love on and that we can bring into your presence. Put people in our path that we can invite to church. 
put people in our path that we can make an eternal difference in. And Father, as we are leading others to you, lead us to you. Because we can't take people where we've never been ourselves. Father, we give you glory and praise this day. In Jesus' name. If somebody love the Lord, said amen. Amen. All right. I love you, but the Lord loves you more. Don't forget all the good things that are going to be taking place this weekend. And, and uh, pray that you can join us Sunday morning for Sunday school, 930, or uh, Sunday morning service, 1045. God bless you. We love you. Shake hands, hug necks because you love one another. And uh, y'all spend some time fellowshipping. Then we'll see you Sunday.